Well, hello, hello, hello there. Welcome to another episode of The Disruption. It's the 13th day of January 2022. At least January is moving quickly. At least it feels like it. Maybe it doesn't. We'll talk a bit more about that. Welcome to another episode of The Disruption. Remember, we do this every Thursday at 5 p.m. on the Citizen TV Facebook page. And for you watching us, whichever part of the world you're watching us from, please post your comments or your questions regarding this show on the chat section of the Citizen TV Facebook page, and we'll be reading your feedback as the broadcast continues. My name is Wahiga Mora. Glad to be your host again on this episode of The Disruption. We're discussing a very important topic, how to start a sustainable business in 2022. What are the lessons learned? We've got the experts here. We've got people who know what the numbers are like, and you can ask all your questions and make your comments on the same note to them. Remember, we were told about two years ago, during the height of the pandemic, 2020, that newly registered businesses, startups, rose by about 95%. But how many of them will survive the long haul? That's what we want to discuss with my guests. Let me introduce them. I will start with, uh, we have Caleb Ocheng. He's the CEO of Afroponics Solution. Thank you, Caleb, for joining us today. Welcome. Uh, we also joined by Sharon Chebet. She's an agri-tech entrepreneur. Sharon, karibu sana. Thank you, Ahiga. Also here with us in studio is Stephen Waitugi. He's a program manager, enterprise development at the Equity Group Foundation. Stephen, always a pleasure. Thank you, Wehiga. And uh, joining us virtually is uh, Victor Otieno. He's not a stranger to the platform. He's the MD of VIFA uh, and a member of the Association for Startups and SME Enablers in Kenya. Victor, virtually welcome to this uh, show. Asante sana and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Oh, good. Happy, we can still do that in this uh, week. Happy New Year do to you too. Until, until, until June, at least. Until June, it's a Happy New Year. Uh, actually, let me start with you, Victor, now, on that, now that we're on that note. You've been researching SMEs for a long time. What, in your view, has been the success, the success rate, so to speak, of SMEs pre-pandemic and then with the large number of people that registered businesses during the pandemic. Are we seeing any numbers to say, to tell us how their businesses are doing? Help us with those numbers, uh, Victor. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, so I think the, the best place to start in terms of SME, at least from a national perspective, is to look at the last um, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics report, which was uh, done in 2016. Of course, this needs to be updated, but as at then, we had around uh, 7.4 million SMEs. Um, and uh, of course, uh, SMEs being the backbone of the economy, contributing 33% of GDP. Um, so it's not all rosy. Um, I think it's a mix, mixed basket in terms of SME performance pre-pandemic, and probably I can even push you to uh, you know the last almost decade, uh, you know, starting from 2017, 2018. Um, so generally, uh, if you look at the data, we see that 90% of the people we call SMEs are micro. So it means that a lot of uh, the businesses that we have in Kenya are quite small. That's number one. Number two is the sector distribution of uh, a lot of our businesses is in wholesale retail. Mm -hmm. So this is purely on data. Um, and what that means is that if you're in wholesale retail, it means that number one is you don't have a competitive advantage. It's very difficult, uh, it's very difficult for you to compete. Um, so it means that, uh, of course, barrier to entry and barrier to exit is quite low. So it means that they are very susceptible to any shock, whether it's uh, elections, whether it's COVID, etc. So having even said that, there are certain sectors that have continued to perform well. Uh, if you are to look at the uh, you know, economic review by KNBS over the last decade, so there are certain sectors that even despite you know, uh, systemic shocks, either through election, disruption through election, uh, COVID, ETC, there are sectors that have continued to perform well. Okay. Um, you know, uh, uh, let, let, such let, let me jump in, Victor. Let me yeah. jump in, Victor, because you've really helped us set the stage. The, the, I want us to discuss the bad news before we get to the good news. So hang on with those stats, uh, because I want you to uh, be able to give them to me shortly. But let me hear from some entrepreneurs who are actually here with us in studio a little bit about their journey. And Sharon, I want to start with you. Just help us understand a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and if we have time, some lessons you've learned. Uh, thank you, Wahiga. So I run an agro-innovation company that has a very unique business model. And I'm saying unique because it's very intentional. We had to think outside the box. Um, that makes sure that we're trying to correct the inefficiencies and dysfunction in the agricultural value chain. And in this case, the key players are both the farmers and the consumers. Um, COVID really gave us a very interesting hint. In fact, for us, it actually worked because we realized that whatever platform we had set up, 
really now came in handy at the time now where they had said lockdown, people could not go to the markets. So now we were able to deliver groceries to their doorstep. And okay, yeah. wow. how did, how did uh, you start your entrepreneurial journey? And is it important how you begin? Because we are told, I think there's some data from a few years back, mm -hmm. that 60, 70 percent of SMEs don't make it to their 10th year. I've even had others say to their third year. Yeah. It's true. Uh, the business plan is very crucial because it basically defines your thoughts and your research and exactly what you want uh, for your business to succeed. Um, we had to come up with a very unique business model and of course looking at all the aspects as the customer segments, the product, what's our unique value proposition, what uh, the revenue streams, I mean our key metrics so that you can be able to check on how the business data is. Um, etc. etc. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, and we'll dig a bit deeper into that shortly. Caleb, okay. let's hear a little bit about Afroponics Solution. For viewers who may not have heard of your business, what do you do? Okay. I'll start by saying Okweuru. Okweuru is a little word that means, are you okay? And uh, you say bear. Now, Afroponics Solution uh, is a, a youth company that uh, mainly deals with the, the word ponics. Is, uh, we, have, uh, we have picked it from the word hydroponics farming, whereby uh, through Equity Bank, we were able to go through some uh, uh, innovations and uh, we went through some institutions where we were trained how to do hydroponic farming, that is soilless farming. And uh, after that, we became specialists. After a while, me with my friends, we joined up and uh, we formed a company where after the first year we gained some challenge which we needed to solve and that's where, where the word solutions come from. So we came up with the idea how we can uh, solve the solutions that we have experienced throughout the whole season and uh, that's how we came up with the main challenge was on, uh, on the production. So in aquaponic solutions, uh, we do training to farmers and also we produce fruity vegetables that we talk of capsicum, cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, among others. So uh, our problem in production came from nutrition where we had to seek uh, uh, experts who trained us how to make nutrients solution that we use in hydroponic farming. So uh, after learning how to make the nutrient solutions, so our company uh, is dealing with training farmers who are uh, eagerly or eager to join hydroponic farming. We train them on making nutrient solution. We also uh, make nutrient solution and sell to the farmers. We also train farmers on uh, doing hydroponic farming systems. And, for, uh, for someone who is listening to you, my brother, and wondering, e hydroponics, yes. kizungu mingi, yes. what is it? Hydroponic farming is simply soilless farming. Soilless what? farming. Soilless farming. We don't use soil. What do you use? Okay. For us, <laughs> uh, we use something uh, we call a nutrient solution. And what is this nutrient solution? Mm. Nutrient solution is simply like uh, any other normal farmer. When he wants to grow his crops, he will have to buy fertilizers and apply them on the farm. For us, we will use these fertilizers and mix them in a proposed ratio. And this fertilizer, we dissolve it in water. And then we take this water direct to the root of the plant. Okay. And that is now hydroponic farming. I'll come back to you to understand how the business is doing. But Stephen, you, you've heard a lot. But the crux of the matter today is that we started a lot of businesses at the height of the pandemic. People lost their jobs. And we are told at the registry that uh, they registered a lot of businesses. But if, if history is anything to go by, we know that the success rate of these businesses could be very different from the registration rate of those same businesses as well. From a banking perspective, from where you sit, what is the success rate of, of your average SME? What are the tough years? What can you tell us? Uh, what I can say, Waihiga, is that, um, yeah, most of the businesses that we have been supporting uh, really went through uh, the, the, the pandemic season and they were... And that, uh, because we understand, we understand them, we were able to tweak our support to them. That is because of the flexibility that we, uh, that we have. And most of them have emerged um, very, very successful because uh, during that time, uh, the businesses that we were interacting with, we were supporting them uh, with uh, ways to, uh, to innovate and the uh, management in, time, in, time, in times of uh, crisis when it comes to uh, non-financial support. And, uh, uh, so we were, we were able to handhold them both from, uh, from a capacity building perspective uh, and also from a, a financing perspective 
we were able to listen to most of them. That those that were going through our, our financial challenges, we were able to, for example, offer them the moratorium because of the, the, the loan uh, uh, repayment periods that were there before. And we have seen most of them, a higher, percent, uh, a higher percentage, more than 80% were able to, um, uh, to overcome the challenges, and most of them are currently doing well. That is those businesses that we were supporting uh, pre-COVID and uh, during COVID, and now, although we, still, we are still in pandemic season, most of these businesses are, are doing well. Where do you think businesses go wrong? You know, and, and I'm glad you've, you've explained to us how the bank worked to these businesses, but what, where, as you analyze their business models and so forth, where do you think the challenges were? Give us a few more specifics. Uh, okay, businesses and MSMEs face a myriad of uh, challenges. Mm. And uh, one of the challenges that, especially these businesses that um, are ran by, by, by youth, one of the main challenges that uh, they face, or one of the main challenges that they face is uh, this, uh, the youth start businesses, I may say for, for a wrong reason. Some of them get to, to business uh, for subsistent purposes, uh, uh, purposes which means they are there not to grow, not to make a lot of profit, but to make, uh, to make money or just to try to, 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 to pass the day such that the, this particular business has no or doesn't have a, a long-term strategy that will enable it to uh, uh, grow from, uh, from a small business, overcome the challenges that it will face uh, uh, during any, 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 any hard times and be able to, uh, 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 to, make, to make money in a sustainable way. But if, if, uh, if our young people or if our youth are able to get into, into a business because one, they are passionate about it, number two, there is, there is a need, and number three, there is a clear plan of how that business will, uh, will grow, they will be able to, uh, to, be, to be sustainable in the, in the long run. The other thing that uh, makes these businesses uh, uh, not to see, uh, most of us say the, the, the third or the fifth the birthday, is because some of them lack the sufficient, uh, they, have, they, they lack sufficient cash flow mm. that is required to, to, to run that particular, particular business. Because what we realize is that the, the oxygen for any business is the cash flow. Mm. If you may have good money or good money to start the business, but there, are some, there is a lot of cash that is required to run that particular, particular business beyond production. And those who are in agriculture, Sharon and, uh, and Caleb will tell you, you can do very well when it comes to, uh, to planting. You, ca you can do very well when it comes to uh, taking care of your crop. Mm. But when it comes to, for example, harvesting and distribution, you don't have cash, which means if you don't have a, 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 a financial partner who understands you, it becomes difficult for you to sell. Mark you, you have, you have, uh, you have produced, or you have very good, uh, uh, you have enough capital to set up the infrastructure, like uh, Caleb is saying, but when it comes to the running of the business, if you don't have sufficient uh, uh, capital or cash flow, then it means you don't have any oxygen to run the, uh, the business. No, those are, those are fair points that you're raising. Uh, Victor, before I come to you, let me allow Sharon to respond. I'm glad we have entrepreneurs here. And Sharon, tell us, from your perspective, what ails most SMEs? The businesses you've run, your friends have run, and so forth. What do you hear are the common complaints? Because I'd like to give Stephen and Victor, who are the experts for this particular discussion, a chance to respond to some of them directly. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll actually concur with what Stephen has said, and it's very true because cash flow is usually a very big challenge because sometimes you realize, even as a business, you're not looking at the revenue streams in terms, especially, sorry, the costing in terms of fixed and variable costs. So you find yourself in a fix where you've not really managed to see how your books are going, and then now you, you're, you're not breaking even, so now you're making losses, and you are definitely in business to make profit. So I think for, for most businesses, it's definitely the cash flows like Stephen has mentioned. And um, apart from that, also just having key KPIs, key performance indicators, just to know if you're having a healthy business or you probably even don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned earlier, and I don't know how much detail you can go into this. Mm -hmm. I think Caleb has properly walked us through the vision that he had when he started his business. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the vision for you? What, how did you identify a gap in your market? Um, I think like any other business plan, when you're coming up, uh, usually the startup cycle, okay, this is how I like viewing the startup cycle, like more from a heroic um, point perspective, mm -hmm. like a, heroic, a hero's journey, sorry. 
um, think about your favorite fictional book or movie, the main character, what are the problems they face, uh, what challenges uh, come, they, do they come across, and probably how now do they solve the problem eventually. So it's more or less on how an entrepreneur's journey uh, begins. And uh, for us, it was probably just trying to create a solution from a problem we identified that had, has been there for quite, a, quite some time. And uh, through that, then when we were starting, it didn't make sense to people because we are more tech-based. Uh, but now, uh, when COVID hit now, I think technology actually really changed everyone's perspective and it now helped us to actually push our agenda better. Okay, oh, yeah. very, very nicely put. Yeah. Uh, Victor, how, how can you then come in? You've had some of the challenges that have been uh, shared by some of the guests here in studio, um, but you also say there are some sectors that where there is life. Uh, I can give you a chance now to share some of those. A proper perspective in terms of the entire spectrum of the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, number one is um, it's easier to blame the entrepreneur for not succeeding uh, but also what we need to realize or take cognizance of is um, Kenyan SMEs or entrepreneurs face systemic risk. Um, I can give you, for example, uh, the last decade, um, the financing that has gone towards the agri agricultural sector has not been more than 3% of the entire loan book of banks. And we are saying agriculture is a very lucrative sector. So in as much as we would say, you know, cash flow is the, is the lifeblood of the business, if the financial uh, ecosystem is not lending to the sector, then it means that that sector um, will, not be, will not be able to grow. Uh, uh, yet we know, you know agriculture is a very um, um, critical cog towards our economy. That's number one. Number two, another critical sector that uh, you know, is very important to the, sector, the, uh, the economy is manufacturing. Manufacturing in terms of access to finance has not, been, um, has pa has not passed more than 9% of the entire loan book of banks in the last decade, and this is data from both Central Bank of Kenya as well as Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. So we have challenges systematically that uh, you know, SMEs are facing, meaning that um, no matter how innovative you are in terms of your business, if you cannot be able to access finance, then it means that you, you can only grow so much. Um, that's number one. Number two is, of, of course, we still have uh, teething issues around regulation. For instance, if you have, if you are a potato farmer in Nyandarwa, it, it, it will take you, you know, it will take a lot of effort for you to move your potatoes from Nyandarwa to um, maybe to Nairobi because of regulatory barriers. So, you know, we have your CES, you have, um, you know, other uh, inter-county taxes that you are levied that would impede you, even if you had a very good business model, for you to be able to uh, meet the, the market. So uh, that gives you perspective in terms of the systemic, uh, systemic challenges that SMEs face. That's number one. Number two is, of course, the entrepreneur is responsible for their business. So what we've seen for a long time is, and I like that the two, uh, the lady and the gentleman there, um, you know, are moving to traditional sectors in a new way, either using technology, etc., which I think is very commendable. But a majority of Kenyans uh, would open car wash, they would open wines and spirits, they would open your traditional businesses, without using any iota of research. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, one of the things that we, we, we need to train ourselves as entrepreneurs is to start to do research, looking for uh, feasible markets, markets that or businesses uh, or entering into sectors where the business model is profitable from the get-go. So when we talk about um, you know, uh, cash flow being the lifeblood of a business, you cannot do that, you cannot get cash flow if you, if you're not in a, if you don't have a sustainable business model, meaning that from the get-go, you know your customers, it's profitable from the get-go. Um, if you look at a majority of our businesses, we are in wholesale retail. We buy stuff from China, come and sell uh, for, a, for a margin. So it means that this business will perpetually be requiring financing. Um, you know, I need to finance my business, I need to finance my business. Your finance or credit will not, uh, you know, uh, replace revenue, which is the cheapest source of revenue of, of cash flow for you for your business. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. I think you've you've captured that quite well, uh, Caleb. Coming to you now, and uh, some interesting points that uh, Victor has raised in regards to really the potential for agriculture in this country, but how we are not meeting it. Mm -hmm. And is it possible that, you know, in a sense, and I want to hear from you on this, about a week ago, so there was a whole big debate on KFC mm -hmm. and potatoes and, and why we're not doing them here and so forth. What do you think are some of the challenges that ail the agricultural sector? And do you think your solution can provide sort of a way forward? 
Okay, what uh, have been a problem with uh, our country, I think, is knowledge, knowledge in agriculture, mm -hmm. so that they can do well in uh, pro production. Mm -hmm. And uh, in hydroponic, sol uh, in uh, uh, aphroponic solution, uh, what we came to realize brings this uh, challenge in knowledge is that uh, when you meet different farmers, everybody have their own way they are doing things. And uh, if you get this farmer will tell you, do this, you will succeed. This other farmer will tell you, do this, you will succeed. And uh, everybody have their own versions. And uh, for you as a person who, as an entrepreneur who want to get in that business, you don't know where to follow. And uh, you get uh, different, different uh, uh, views from people. You mm. don't know which one is the best. And uh, that leads you to a failure because you will do something which you are not sure that is working. So according to us, we developed an app as a aphroponic solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, this app, we developed it when we were in a fact-finding mission on the correct way of uh, doing agriculture. Mm -hmm. Now, in this app, for, uh, in the, this year, we have been collecting data whereby each and every farmer will do their farming, all the activities according to the way they know it. If you are to put the, let's say, fertilizers today, you are to spray the pesticide, you are to do what, for us, we are interested with what do you put into your crop from the day one to the last day of the season, mm. and then we are collecting the data. Now, after collecting the data, we'll an analyze it. This farmer A, farmer B, farmer C, and uh, blah, blah, blah. They did this, all, all of them, they planted this, and uh, this farmer, this 10 farmers got powdery mildew, that's one of the disease uh, attacking the crops, and uh, this farmer used this against it, this other farmer used this, and then we are interested in the outcome. Which one worked, which one did not work? So after getting this information, this data, is now we put them on our platform whereby many farmers who are using our app can now get uh, the, fact, the, the real fact on the ground that if you use this, you will solve this problem. If you, don't use, if you use this, you will not solve the problem. Now mm. that is the reality on the ground because uh, what is affecting our farmers is knowing the actual thing to do on the ground. Yeah. And is it working? What, what, do you have numbers? Yeah, so far, so far we are... We have uh, over 700 farmers using our app. And uh, last year, we were collecting the data. And we have collected the data for the whole year. That's whole season. And right now, we are in the process of uh, doing the summary and analyzing it, getting the ways which one is not working, which one is working. And then all the information after analyzing it, we will put it on the platform so that all our farmers and many more farmers who will join our platform will be getting the right uh, information on what to do on farming. Okay, very, very interesting um, approach there to looking at solutions for challenges that availed the sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and Stephen, I can come to you at this time. Uh, again, a wider picture on the key factors that affect startups. And I know you, you know, already gave us a, 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 an input into that. But what sort of support then? And you said, you know, you, for example, during COVID, you said you held the hands of entrepreneurs. Mm. Help us understand specifically what did that hand holding look like? And is it possible to hold the hands of entrepreneurs even beyond the pandemic? Yeah, thanks, Wahiga. It is, it is, it is possible to hold, uh, to hand hold the entrepreneurs even past, uh, past COVID because what we were doing, number one, is uh, we interacted a, lo a lot with them uh, through, uh, through uh, online session because, you know, that time we could not meet physically, but we organized for, for online sessions where uh, we would try to expand their thinking in terms how can they diversify their, their services, their products uh, beyond what they have, uh, they, have, uh, they have been doing. Some of those businesses were, were very physical in terms of uh, location. You find them in, some, in a certain place but we could introduce um, uh, uh, these businesses to online marketing or how to increase their presence in the, in the digital space such that their customers will not only visit them some in, in, some, in some place for them to be able to buy, but they can sell, they can sell, they can market and sell and sell online. Mm -hmm. The other thing we were, we were, we were taking them through is uh, it's, it's, it's mentorship, as in uh, dig, uh, mentoring them uh, virtually. Mm -hmm. That is linking them 
uh, thinking the, 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 the young entrepreneurs with those who have been there previously, those who have had uh, experience, those whose businesses has, uh, has endured such like, uh, such like challenges because as Caleb is, is saying, most of these uh, uh, businesses, they, they don't know what to do in terms of challenge, but when they are attached to a, uh, to a mentor, they are, able to, uh, they are able to work with them, they are able to guide them, they are able to show them the way, they are able to, uh, uh, to point before, uh, before be, uh, to point to these uh, young entrepreneurs where they can, they can fail even before, uh, before, before they, uh, they get there. So we did a lot of, uh, a lot of mentorship and a lot of, a lot of training, a lot of uh, showing them uh, the opportunities that are beyond uh, their, their mainstream, uh, mainstream business and even how to manage their businesses in, term, in times of, uh, in times of uh, crisis, uh, when it comes to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the financials, how do, you, how, do you, how do you manage your finances during that time? How do you re uh, reallocate your finances uh, to, more, uh, to more rewarding uh, product clients instead of just uh, remaining in one, in one line that uh, they are used to? Okay, v very interesting. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's writing in and watching us from wherever you're watching us from. Remember, you can post your question or your comment. We have the experts here, both in studio and joining us virtually, who can respond to some of your questions and your comments as well. I've got uh, two questions that are looking quite similar. First of all, Fiji San Jo Mike. Weh, some names on Facebook. You're saying you're watching from Kikuyu, and your colleague in hydroponics farming is Caleb Ochien. Caleb, do you know this Fiji San? Does that name sound familiar? Uh, I know many people. So you know many people. I'm happy that I know him. They say that you are their colleague in hydroponics. Oh, uh, that's great. We have two others who have asked uh, sort of similar questions, and I want uh, uh, to give Sharon a chance to respond to this. Jason Wiener, you say, uh, starting an SME in Kenya is a risk because of taxes and a lot of unwanted licenses. Mm -hmm. Jacob Makokoyo, Mark Okoyo says, brilliant ideas, mm -hmm. but government has no mercy on small-scale businesses. A very exorbitant taxes, concerns about regulation in this country. Mm -hmm. Sharon, have you faced um, that yes, challenge? Yes, I have definitely faced that challenge, Wahiga. Thank you for the question. Uh, what I can advise is, first of all, you need to determine your business structure because um, like we have options, is, is it a sole proprietorship, is that a partnership, is it a limited liability, etc. Uh, once you do that, then now you're able to, it's, it's very important for you to engage with a lawyer because now once you set up the business structure, you'll be able to know now the legal and the tax requirements that are needed so that you also don't put yourself in a fix. You also need to figure out about copyright issues, trademark, patents, etc. Yeah. Any way in which lack of knowledge has hindered your business, taxes, regulation, whatever it is? Uh, Any examples? Yes. Uh, when I was starting out, there's the usual filing of returns, but then you see now when you're not even sure how your business is faring and you're making losses, you find yourself trying to hide from even, you know, filing returns, and now you get into a tax issue with the tax authorities. So I think it's very important for you from the get-go to have your business structure right, to engage a lawyer, to also engage a professional in uh, finances, so that you're able to at least um, mitigate any, any unforeseen events in the future, because you'll definitely pay dearly for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, Vic, I think you can come in now on this. We have Mzalendo Jr. who says maintaining a business is a big challenge. One should do his research well. I started at Kinyozi. It lasted three months. It seems I didn't do my research. Vic, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, research is very important, but I also wanted to comment on the issue, uh, issue around regulation and tax. Mm -hmm. I think we, we must also give credit its due. Um, if you look at the reforms that have taken place uh, over the last decade in terms of uh, the business climate, I think government have done really well uh, in terms of uh, currently you can actually do your registration, um, get your PIN, get your NSF, get an NHF uh, seamlessly through e-citizen. So I think uh, from a broader perspective, I think government has really done well. Uh, of course, there are teething issues around taxes, you know, trying to harmonize that with the county's ETC. I think that that is still a challenge. I also wanted to comment on the issue around um, agriculture. Um, so um, if you go to the Ken trade or, uh, and, uh, and you go to their portal on um, in, uh, import trade, mm -hmm. you realize that uh, we still uh, are importing rice, peanuts, fruits, etc. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is that we have a lot of peanuts or groundnuts on Jugukaranga for, 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 for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. But if you are to talk to processors who are making peanut butter, they are importing peanuts from Malawi, uh, from other countries, etc. 
and uh, what is happening with our farmers again because of lack of lack of information i think as caleb had alluded is that there is a mismatch between what the farmers are producing and the practices that they have mm. with what the market wants mm. so i think even as entrepreneurs as farmers or in any other sector we need to be able to um, have foresight in terms of what the what are the needs of the market um in 2019 for uh, for example we import we exported uh, coconut uh, as a product uh, worth around 500 million and at the same time we imported over 700 million worth of coconut products whether My it's uh, you know coconut uh, uh, you know oil etc so it tells you that we still have we have a demand of coconut uh, uh, added products worth 700 million that needs that can be met internally if you are just to put our uh, our act right and we have government um, um, portals, uh, Keproba, which is Grand Kenya. We have Kentry, we have Leather Council. There are places that you can actually go and get market intelligence in terms of actual market, both um, um, within the country as well as in uh, foreign nations. Um, in, and, where, and you can be able to explore that and use that data to uh, structure your business and, of course, uh, succeed at that. So research is very important and it doesn't have to cost you anything, it's as good as just uh, looking at uh, you know a site um of, of course if you need any support you can be able to call some of these uh, government agencies and probably you can be able to get support what happens with a lot of us as entrepreneurs it's easier to complain without actually going to a government office uh, whether it's keproba whether it's kentred whether it's epz and just getting the full information in terms of us being able to uh, you know um, access these markets then if you are to do that then the issue around taxation doesn't um, hit you as such because mm. you have a sustainable model and whenever you make your sales or whatever tax is always catered for and okay. this by no means am I saying that uh, uh, the high taxes are okay I'm just saying if you're to focus on value uh, have a, a business model that can be able to generate revenue then the, the, the impact of tax might, might, might not be as hard as, as compared to if you're investing in a business that is not sustainable, that is loss making, then of course you will struggle um, you know, um, you know, paying your taxes. All right, very, very interesting. Thank you, Victor, for that. Let me allow Caleb to also weigh in. Caleb, I hope you're getting ideas, new business lines that you can look at sure, uh, sure. moving forward. Uh, did you face similar challenges when you were starting? How did the program that you did with uh, Equity help you navigate through some of those challenges? Okay, so the main challenge that uh we faced was a lack of information, and that's uh, brought in the matter of uh, app. Uh, apart from that, we also got some uh, challenge on uh, getting the suppliers who will uh, delay you in payment. And as uh, uh, Buana Steve earlier said, that flow of cash <laughs> is very important in business. So you get that uh, it uh, delays your uh, way of uh, purchasing your, pro uh, your input and also operation, and uh, this one uh, drives you back. So the best way is uh, uh, getting link to the right people to do business with, and uh, through mentorship with uh, Equity, we have uh, been uh, doing a lot of research with the people we are working with, uh, because now we have done a lot of training in digitization. We know how to uh, market our products, and uh, from that we get the right people to work with, and uh, fr uh, we, we, we get how to navigate through it. Okay, okay, that, that's very interesting. Stephen, I want to read some feedback here and see whether you want to uh, reference any of them. Kevin Ward, Eunice, you say, what businesses can one start with 50,000? What challenges should one be ready to face? How do you overcome that? That's one question. Kim Anji is saying, how can a foreigner start a business in Kenya? And Kelvin Kandia says, what happens when you already have the knowledge of production but lack adequate market for your produce? Is there a body that helps farmers find market with good prices. I know Victor might take some, but let me allow you, Stephen, a chance to, to also weigh in even as you respond to what some of the other panelists are saying. Um, what uh, I may want to say is that uh, we, we may not be able to tell uh, somebody specifically, go and invest in transport, go and invest in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, hard, in hardware. What we, we, we normally do is that you need yourself to uh, to do a bit of a, a bit of research, which should be guided, uh, to be able to, to to be able to come up with a, to be able to see a need or a gap within uh, within the society, within the community, within a within a, a value chain 
that you can, you, your product or service uh, is, uh, is required. What there is is, uh, before you invest your, your 50,000 in a certain, in a certain uh, product or in provision of a certain, uh, a certain uh, a service, it may, you need to, to clearly understand um, and to be convinced that whatever you want to do is, uh, will, uh, is, is needed and whatever you want to do, um, you are convinced at the end of the day it will give, uh, give you money and should be something that you are doing freely uh, uh, without, being, uh, without being pushed. Because uh, if, if you have 50,000, I'm sure you don't want just to invest in something that you don't believe in. You want to invest in something that you really, you really uh, uh, believe in. Therefore, you will need to put some, some work to do, uh, to do research, as uh, 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 the rest of the panelists are, are agreeing with, that you need to understand the market, the entire, the entire, the entire value chain, so that you don't encounter uh, problems like one of the viewers has said, that you produce, but you are not able to sell. And that has been a challenge in our, in our, in our markets, because as Kenyans, we produce then try struggling to sell mm. instead of doing research so that we can produce what we can sell. So I would say, with your 50,000, just do your, your homework, do your research, identify a gap, a gap that, uh, that, uh, that, is, that is needed. You understand your, your product, you understand your market uh, clearly. Uh, also, be able to explain the expenses that will be required and at what time of of the provision of the service, and out of that, how will you be able to uh, to make money? Otherwise, uh, if I direct you to a certain uh, to a certain uh, uh, value chain or to a certain enterprise, then it doesn't uh, go well. You will come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> that time is guided. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I don't know what uh, what uh, Sharon thinks about that. Uh, you know, there are people here saying, for example, I have someone here saying, let me read. Where is that message? S K Wanja. How much is enough capital to start a business for a virgin starter? So people out there want you to tell them how much money they need. Some of them want to know what business ideas. Is that how you should, is that the attitude of an entrepreneur? Um, I beg to defer that. Um, my sentiments would definitely be, first of all, before you're coming up with a business plan, you already know exactly what you want to do. If it's a solution you're bringing out to a problem, you already know what, how you want to go about it. So I'd definitely advise you to, first of all, have a very clear business plan, come up with a very good business model, and then now try and raise money. You can raise money from family or friends, can take a loan from them, you can look for institutions that give out money as well. You can probably then do crowdfunding. I've had people doing crowdfunding and they've turned out actually really well. You can, okay, venture capital comes probably in a later stage when you're scaling your business because they usually look at proof of concept, but that's notwithstanding. I believe that you can always start from somewhere, start with what you have, and then now build through because it's a journey. I mean, Rome was not built in a day, so you can't be a millionaire overnight. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Vic, I want to ask the same question. Uh, your way. Uh, have, you, have you done a survey to find out whether there's an average amount people should be ready with when they want to start a, a business, especially <laughs> this one is calling him or herself a virgin starter. Never really engaged in this before. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, let me see. Moh Mohed Dek Elmi says, I'm tuned in from Wajir. Apart from tax, is the, apart from tax, the other challenge is the money to start a business giving it to the right people who desire to invest it properly. So this whole startup capital issue, well, what, is, what does the research say about it? How much is enough? Do I need 50,000? Do I need 100,000? Can I do something with 10,000? Yeah, so I think it's, a, it's just a matter of the sector that you would want to invest in. But I think there are two questions that were raised before I could answer that. Number one was uh, someone had asked if they, uh, how they would go about if they were foreigner and they would want to invest in Kenya. Um, I think what I can direct them is uh, the Ken Invest. We have Ken Invest, which is an agency that focuses on supporting foreign entities to invest in Kenya. I think if you go to their website, you can be able to get uh, quite a uh, good of help. Uh, number two is the Ministry of ESC and uh, Regional East Africa Community and Regional Development has uh, a toolkit called uh, Kenya Business Regulated Guide.com. It's a, it's a portal that you can be able to use and get information in terms of um, investment in Kenya. Um, so I think uh, for me, the, the, the question should not be how much I need. It, it should be that what, uh, what business, which business or which sector or which products should I invest in and they, can they be profitable? Um, if once, I, I think as um, 
as uh, uh, Sharon had mentioned, it's always good to have your business model right. Because the first uh, form of financing for, for your business is always, always profit. So the moment you make your sale and you're able to uh, get a bit of profit, it means that that business is sustainable even, and it will make it easier for uh, either family, friends, banks, or any other financial institutions to give you help. It's very difficult, it's a very difficult conversation to say, to start from uh, money instead of starting from an idea. I always say money follows ideas. Ideas should not follow money. As you're saying that, Sharon is, is taking notes. I think she's uh, paying keen attention to what you're saying. Uh, Caleb, so, so innovating, moving forward, you've got this brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether you're making money yet or not, but what's your plan now to take it to the next level so that your business survives, whatever other disruptions may come? Okay, let me come and uh, highlight what Caleb is doing so that uh, you can know how I'm, I can survive with uh, my vision. So Caleb is a trainer. I'm training people who want to involve in hydroponics farming. That is, uh, I've managed to train over 30 farmers who are now doing soilless farming. They are not using soil farming. Why do we run out from soil? It's because we have soil borne diseases, like in my place in Juja, uh, we have some coffees which were done there a long time ago, and you get that. Uh, there they are some uh, nematodes that they live around that when you plant your crop, you will uh, terribly fail because of the diseases. Now, apart from training, I'm also formulating new trend solution for hydroponic farmers, which I sell. I also train hydroponic farmers how to uh, uh, how to make their own solution because if you buy the hydroponics uh, nutrients, it will be it will uh, it will cost you more than someone who just buys salts and make the, uh, the, 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 the solutions. Uh, apart from that, I also produce. Caleb is a producer, hydroponic producer, and we do a lot of production that we, when we talk of fruity vegetables. Now, the app is just bringing the solution. Uh, to what we are, uh, we as farmers now are experiencing, and uh, through that, through that, I believe uh, we will up our game in farming, and we'll never, we'll never, never, never ever go through such problems again. Getting that tomatoes in Kenya are not this quality, and blah blah blah. As I listen to you, I'm wondering: Are you a farmer or a scientist? I am a farmer who is doing good research. <laughs> You're a farmer. Do, did you have to go somewhere to study this, or this is just your own? personal sort of initiative? Uh, Equity uh, Bank took us uh, uh, in, in with other partners, I can mention one JZ, took us to an institution which, uh, who, or which trained us on hydroponic farming. Mm -hmm. And uh, after training, Equity gave us a startup which we took in form of a loan which we used to build our greenhouses. And uh, after knowing what this kind of farming was uh, <laughs> helping on, uh, on, 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 on in Kenya, which is, uh, I can say, most farmers don't practice it. After knowing its importance, is, now, is when now I became a trainer to involve more farmers uh, uh, to be added in the act so that we can, we, can, we, we, we can achieve this together, getting mass production and so on. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, Stephen, tell us more about that program. The other entrepreneurs watching and listening saying, I also want to join that program. I, thank you, Ahiga, and thank you, Caleb, for that. that, that uh, the partnership that uh, we have had uh, with the, with the uh, organizations that Caleb has, has mentioned, uh, the program is anchored under, under our, our program that we are calling Young Africa Works. I'm sure you have heard about mm -hmm. this. And it is geared towards uh, uh, job creation and support, uh, supporting youth and youth-owned um, uh, enterprises. So we partnered uh, 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 with an organization that was, uh, was, uh, was training these youths on how to produce, uh, to produce um, uh, vegetables, that is uh, tomatoes and other vegetables through uh, hydroponics. Mm -hmm. And because that was, and most of our youths, you know, they, they, want this, uh, they want to, they are very receptive to technology and hydroponic is technology-based. Uh, we moved forward to, to, to link them uh, with that institution so that they can, they can first get the skills, and number two, they can get the, the, the infrastructure. 
uh, for, 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 for the production, and they can also get other inputs that are required in that particular, uh, particular uh, value chain. What we also did is to ensure there is an end-to-end -end link. That is, they are able to uh, they are able to get they are able to put, to be to be to be trained on uh, production, and they are uh, they are linked to market or to those who will be buying their their product. Because if they do uh, very well in production and they, they they don't get to sell their product, they will not be able to pay the uh, the, the, the the facility that they were they, they were they, they were given to start uh, to start the business. What we did initially is to ensure that we support these uh, youths to refine their. They are, they are business ideas, that is asking the hard, them the hard question, do they have the time that is required, do they have the skills, do they have the, uh, the commitment, and will they go individual or they will form a group? Mm -hmm. Because there are different, they are different, um, they, they, they are different arrangement that if, if one is not an individual, they can be supported from what you have had previously, the uh, Pamoja banking, and so on and, and so forth. So um, after supporting them with the, with the, with the, with the refining their business ideas in generating a business idea uh, course, they go to starting your business, then the next level we are going to take them is on how uh, to, exp to expand their business. Like Caleb is saying, we can be able to, 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 support, uh, to support him and th those that they are, uh, they are working with, because you have said they are doing training, they are doing production, they are doing um, uh, selling of the solutions, but those farmers that are being trained and they are adopting the technology, where are they getting the uh, the infrastructure. I think that is an area that Caleb can can venture into or can think about, and uh, will be very ready to uh, to support. Okay. So that is what we have been doing. Okay. One thing I get very curious whenever I meet uh, strong entrepreneurs, Caleb here, and of course Sharon is given a chance, uh, dream job pays you the salary you want. Would you leave entrepreneurship, Sharon? Personally, I wouldn't. <laughs> You're not just saying it because we are live no, on this no, platform. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm being very honest because for me, I'm looking at uh, how I'll expand the business in future and the growth that would come with it. So um, I'm not just looking at the now, I'm also looking into the future. So it's something that I'm really passionate about and I feel like it could also bring in more opportunities for people here. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Mm. That, uh, Caleb, are you in the same boat? For me, Isaac, when uh, Equity Bank facilitated me, they only gave me one greenhouse. Right now, I'm managing eight greenhouses. Wow. Oh, <laughs> they wow. don't know how. <laughs> These are physical. If you go there now, I'll see greenhouses. Yes, not, yes. Not I, I want you to come. I train you. Mm. You see more on hydroponic farming. Mm. You see how the system works. Mm. It is very, very technological, and uh, I'll appreciate if you come. So I, right now, I have seven. So if you ask me, can I leave this much investment and go back to work for someone? <laughs> no, I can't. Wow. Uh, uh, Victor, come in. I don't know if, if, if this is helping you with the research you do, uh, but uh, let me read two questions here, and Victor, I'd like to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Zalendo Jr. says, one business idea, you can sell clothes, food online. It's a nice side hustle. They're responding to an Esther Waitara who said, which sector should an employee invest in as a side business? Vic, tell us about now those who don't want to be full-time entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but just want to have a side hustle. And I don't know if banks also support uh, side hustles, uh, whether they are taken <laughs> as seriously as uh, that. But f we'll, we'll pose that one to Buana Steven here. You tell me about uh, side gigs. Mm. Someone wants to know which sector they should uh, look at. Yeah, so, um, you know, business operates uh, under principles. So whether you're doing it as a, as a side hustle or um, as a full-time business, uh, the business model has to be right. What, and we, in February, we usually do a, a report called the State of Side Hustle in Kenya. So uh, what we try to um, encourage is for you to still stick to the values of business, mm. uh, have a business, uh, go into sectors that, uh, has sustainab that are sustainable in terms of business model. But just as I, as I mentioned, because we've done um, uh, quite a bit of uh, studies around op opportunities, especially because of COVID, opportunities that businesses can venture into. Um, maybe as an example, I gave you an example of the coconut value chain. We, we currently import over 700 million worth of uh, coconut uh, uh, byproducts. So there, there is a value addition both in the coconut value chain as well as other value chains where we still export most of our products. Raw. So uh, that uh, is um, a challenge to entrepreneurs to be able to dig into those sectors. Uh, number two, I, I think as Caleb has entered is has, has already entered or into is hydroponic farming. I think uh, based on uh, you know uh, capital, it's it's an easier way. It's an it's a low barrier to entry. 
a business that you can be able to explore even as you as you as you go towards farming there is plastic recycling uh, there's a huge market uh, around recycling uh, plastic uh, for different products of course this uh, 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 you know there is a lot of money uh, around impact investors who can be able to put money um, around uh, around uh, this particular sector so i think those are the particular the sectors that i feel that um, 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 are profitable of course manufacturing manufacturing traditionally has been very sustainable if you have to look at uh, the world over we still are importing nails so iron we still import iron nails to date we still import knives we, sp we still import razor blades we still are importing toothpicks we are still importing furniture uh, for uh, different markets within kenya so the opportunities are boundless of course uh, using uh, uh, this broad data can give you an indicator of the sectors or the products that you want to invest in. Yeah. Um, again, there are different uh, uh, players within the ecosystem that can help you. We have Equity Bank there, we have, uh, you know, JZ, we have, um, you know, we have even government. You know, there are different government agencies, uh, Kenya Industrial Estate, um, you know, uh, Kirdi, there are different agencies, uh, both within government and outside government, that can be able to help you and support you um, uh, as you invest in these uh, lucrative sectors. Okay, Vic, thanks so much for that. And in the interest of time, we'll take that as your final word. Let me get a, a final word from each of my guests here in studio as we wrap this up. The time has flown by really quickly. Um, Sharon, I was to hear from you on, on what, what next then for you. I, Caleb has given us his vision. What about for you? Um, for us, what next is, uh, I think I also concur with him, civic education. We need to do a lot of civic education, especially around uh, working closely with farmers to... Uh, to probably like you know work around traceability because that is what the consumers are looking for nowadays we're living in a world where we have a lot of um, diseases happening uh, which are most, most of them actually based on lifestyle like diabetes type 2 we have cancer cases etc so traceability has become really key in how to show that the farmers really need to prove how they're growing their produce and now also the consumers will now build their trust for that so yeah, so for us, that's, that's, that's our biggest challenge and that's what we're working on. And that's what you're working on. How important are, are partnerships for when you're starting a business uh, in terms of getting the right people to help you where you're weak and that sort of thing? Yeah, partnerships are very uh, important because when you do your SWOT an analysis, that's the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, you realize that it can't be a one-man show. You'll need to hire professionals, you'll need to look for mentors to help you hold your hands so at, at least as, as you go along the way, you're not making the wrong decisions. Okay, yeah. okay. Thank, thank you for that. Caleb, any thoughts, any last word maybe before Buona Steven wraps it up for us? Uh, my last word will be uh, to inform more farmers uh, because now I'm, in, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on their way. Mm -hmm. So inform them to seek good knowledge on how to uh, produce, uh, produce bulky, uh, produce so that we can even us serve our market and export to other countries. And if you can, in, if we can increase uh, food production in our country, we will never cry again. Wow. Okay. Um, I actually had a thought that just uh, uh, slipped my mind. I recently spoke to someone who said the days of when you talk about agriculture, everybody thinks just farming. But there are so many other opportunities along the value chain. For you, it sounds like teaching will eventually become your mainstay, as opposed to physical farming. Uh, is that something you've thought of, Caleb, or it's a, you can do the two concurrently? For me, I will do the two concurrently. Okay. Because uh, right now we have a company, and uh, we are still developing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far, I can say through all that project, we have been able to buy a land in Georgia and we want to, buy, to build many greenhouses. So that makes me, I'll be very busy producing as well as I'll be involving more farmers uh, in this way of production so as we, uh, we, we, we fight this together. Okay, fight this together. Stephen, wrap it up for us uh, on this. Uh, any word of advice to entrepreneurs out there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Mahiga, you asked whether the banks support uh, side hustles. Yes, yes, I did. Yeah, what... Uh, what we normally do when we are looking at the businesses, we don't, it doesn't matter whether it is a hide, side hustle or it is, a, it is your main, uh, main hustle. As long as your business model is okay and uh, your business looks sustainable in terms of, uh, in term, in terms of uh, market availability, production, the cost and the revenue, we will, we will, uh, we will support you. For, 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 for this year, I would want to encourage more youths to get intera to interact with the, 
with equity from our different branches. As you can hear from Caleb, we, are, we, we have a, a huge task to support uh, more youth uh, to be in employment, in this case uh, self-employment. We have the resources, we have a department that is dedicated to handhold you, refine your idea, uh, to start your business and even expand, and we have, the, we have, we have room to allow to, 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 for you to access, uh, to access finances. So welcome to any of our equity branches for the support. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, because I still have one more minute, let me give Vic one last word. Vic, from the surveys you did uh, last year, fundamentally, how did the pandemic transform the SME space? And when might we see that correcting itself? Will that even happen? Yeah, so um, I think, as I mentioned, the last decade, we've seen um, a skewed uh, investment of SME towards wholesale retail. So uh, a lot of entrepreneurs were buying stuff from other countries, China, Vietnam, ETC, to come sell in Kenya. Mm. Um, of course, uh, during the advent of Chinese investors coming, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs face the heat. So there is a, a push towards investment in sectors that are more sustainable, that are less susceptible to external shocks. So uh, we are seeing, of course, we're seeing like as Caleb is investing as well as Sharon, investing in sectors that you know have sustainable business models and can be able to scale and compete globally. I think that's a cue. Uh, currently, we also have a big wave in Africa around uh, around startups. So startups in the sense of businesses that are founded and or based uh, are founded or based on in technology. So that's an area that a lot of entrepreneurs are also moving towards. Uh, we are looking at cause, cause, the world is becoming global. Um, so uh, um, scaling becomes part and parcel of your business. So we should be able to see that uh, as, we, as we move forward. So we definitely need to see more entrepreneurs being able to sort of meet the large orders that the world is demanding and, exactly. and do it in an affordable way. Exactly. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And that's where we wrap up this discussion. This has been another episode of The Disruption. We are in the second week of 2022. And uh, time is quickly moving, but uh, people must get the ideas rolling. And I want to thank each of my guests who have uh, sacrificed some of their time to be here with us today. Joining us virtually has been Victor Otieno, MD, VIFA, and a member of the Association for Startup and SME Enablers in Kenya. Joining us in studio, we've got some great entrepreneurs here. Sharon Chebet, Agritech Entrepreneur, Asante Sana, and Caleb Ocheng, CEO, Afroponics Solution. Thank you for that as well. And not forgetting Stephen Waitugi, Program Manager, Enterprise Development, Equity Group Foundation, uh, a man who has held the hand of uh, Caleb in this journey. And it was interesting to hear some of those insights as well. And of course, for everyone who's written in, uh, sent in your questions, your comments, uh, and seeing a lot of discussions happening in the chat section of that uh, uh, Facebook Live, let's keep it going. Let's keep sharing information, keep sharing ideas to make life better for all of us. Remember, we do this every Thursday, 5 p.m. on the Citizen TV Facebook page. We're going to be back next week, same time, same place, fresh topic, helping you make better financial decisions, get ideas, get businesses, get thoughts that can make your 2022 better. My name is Wahiga Moora. It's been great hosting all of you. Stay safe wherever you are. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.